This week we are talking about how change is coming. In our gospel reading, we got the chance to hear of a man with a one-on-one with God. When it help us look far further into this, I have a video from the skit guys showing us a one-on-one between a man and God. Ephesians 2.10 says that we are God's workmanship, his masterpiece. I don't know about you, but when I get up in the morning and look in the mirror, I don't really see a, a masterpiece, you know? I mean, maybe a Picasso. It's like, <laughs> But I want to be his masterpiece. I want to be everything he created me to be. And so I go to him in prayer and I say, Dear Heavenly Father, do whatever it takes to mold me into the image of your son. Make me your masterpiece. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hi. Whoa. Who are you? I'm God. You said the prayer, so here I am. You're not God. No, I am. You said the prayer. That's how it works. Okay, okay. If you're God, then uh, make it snow in here. You know what? I really don't want to make it snow in here because it'd get kind of yucky. Yeah, you're not God. Why do you say that? God wouldn't say yucky. I do. It's a Greek word. Oh. Okay, okay. Um, if you're God, what does Lamentations 15.9 say? Lamentations is only five chapters. It's a very short book. Oh. Why was it so short? I was tired of lamenting. Oh. Okay, okay. If you're God, who's going to win the World Series this year? I'm really not into playing games. Why are you so much into playing games? You are God. What well, gave it away? You answered my question with a question. I did? <sighs> yeah, I do that. Don't I? I did it again. <laughs> Step right up. Here we go. Okay. All right. Hey, what are we doing? I'm going to make you my original masterpiece. This is the process. Oh, okay. Got it. Yeah. Wait, wait. What are these about? These are the tools I'm going to use to make you into my original masterpiece. Okay. Yeah. Hang on. Yeah. I thought you were a carpenter. That's my son. Step right up. Here we go. Okay. Oh, hey, God. Mm -hmm. How do you know what to chisel away and what to leave? I take out everything in your life that doesn't belong there, kind of like dead weight. Ooh, speaking of dead weight, could you chisel right here? It showed up when I was in my 20s and grew around and became back fat. I don't even know why you created that, but I can't get rid of it. I mean, I've tried everything. Like, I tried running, I tried lifting weights. My wife actually talked me into trying Pilates. That was awkward. But I can't get rid of it. So if you would just chisel around here, and then, you know what, if you chisel a line right here and maybe four to five, maybe eight lines right here. That would be awesome. You're funny. You made me that way. I also made the platypus. With the platypus? All I'm saying is most of my children, when it comes to this process, they just want to talk, but they don't want to do the work. So do you want to talk or can I chisel? Talk, chisel, No, talk, no, chisel. no, 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 no. I choose to chisel. All right. Through my Holy Spirit, I'm going to bring up things in your life that I want you to work on. Like your anger. I created the emotion, but you use it in the wrong way. Um, you compare yourself to others instead of me. You tell little white lies because you want to people please. You're lazy. But you try to fool everybody by looking really, really busy. You have a problem with lust? Well, time out. <laughs> I don't really have a problem with lust. You don't have a problem with lust. No, I can do it anytime I want. <sighs> Hang on a second. I mean, I, I, I got to admit, I, I feel like you've been doing some great work and I'm looking pretty good right now. All right, when you look in the mirror, who do you see? I see me. Okay, then I need to keep chiseling away because ultimately you and other people need to see my son. Okay, don't misunderstand me. It's just um, when I look more like Jesus, people get uncomfortable around me. I mean, even my church friends, and they're like, oh, you're holier than thou, you know? And, and I, don't, I don't think I'm supposed to make people uncomfortable. So what you're saying is you'd rather play God in certain areas of your life than for me to be God over your whole life. That is not what I said. It's what you meant. Yes, it is. Um, it's hard to talk to you. You know everything that I'm thinking. I'm just saying you've done some great work. Maybe we take a break, a sabbatical from each other, you know. I'll stay right here and then, you That's know. That's just it. You never just stay right there. You're either moving toward me or away from me, but never you just stay. What you're doing is called control. Do you want to control things or life or can I chisel? Control, chisel, control, no, chisel. No, chisel, chisel. All right. But can we chisel where I want? That's called control. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Now this right here, this secret sin that you keep running to whenever you're hurting, angry, lonely, tired, that you think you're fooling everybody, but it's making you a whitewashed tomb. Are you ready for me to chisel this out of your life? Yeah. See, it's a process. It's not a sprint. It's a marathon. It's your whole life. 
and you care so deeply about what other people think of you. It's rubbish. It's garbage. The greatest thing you're ever going to hear is at the end of your life when you hear me say, well done, good and faithful servant. That's what you keep your eye on. That's the prize. Heavenward. Oh, that hurts. Oh, trust me. This hurts me more than it hurts you. Right. Okay. I'm sorry. I just, I don't think you understand this pain. Pardon me? You're asking me to sacrifice a lot, God. Don't talk to me about sacrifice. I know all about sacrifice. I sent my son to die on the cross for pain, for sin, but I also did it for another reason, to give you freedom. Do you know what insanity is? Insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again, expecting different results. And there are things that you've been doing for years, these empty wells that don't have anything to offer. You've been going to them and it's insane. Allow me to chisel them out of your life. Um, allow me to produce character where you keep focusing so much on your image. Okay, but I was thinking. Your thoughts are not my thoughts. Okay, but if we went another way. Your ways are not oh, my ways. Oh, I can't. You can't what? I, I, I can't be good. That's your excuse. That's your excuse is that you can't be good. It's not an excuse. I can't. Oh, my child. In the beginning, I said it was good. I made you good. Be good. Yeah, but you and I both. What? Nothing. No, what is it? Nothing, okay? You wouldn't understand. I, God of all the universe, wouldn't understand something one of my children has to say. Try me. It's just, um, I let you down so many times, God. No, my child. You were never holding me up. I hold you up with my victorious, righteous right hand. Never the other way around. In this relationship, I hold you up. Okay chisel away. But just, just be prepared for what you're going to find in there. Because I know who's inside there. Because I get up every morning and I look at him in the mirror and I hate who I see. Because deep inside there, this, this, this little kid who gets up every morning and dresses like an adult. And I go out and I, and I try to do what I'm supposed to do, but I can't, okay? I can't be who everybody else expects me to be. God, I can't even be who I want to be, much less who you created me to be. And so inside is this scared, stupid little kid. But you chisel away. Just be prepared. You have listened to so many voices for far too long that were not for me. And you have totally bought into the lie, haven't you? You think you're junk, don't you? When you lay your head down at night after you've done the dance to get the hug, you think you're junk. Listen to me, I don't take time to make junk. How can I show you that my love for you stretches as far as the east to the west? That How can I show you that my love for you has no end? I know, reach your back pocket. What? Reach your back pocket. Why? Are you arguing with me? Reach your back pocket. Oh, God. Yes? I just meant, God, I'll do that right now. You're just saying my name in vain. Come on, it's, it's a name, it's a saying. It's a name above all names. It's more than a saying, it's more than a name. I want to teach you something about my name. Reach in your back pocket. Oh my gosh. You know what that is? Yeah, it's a, uh, it's a note. I, I wrote it when I was in college. How did you get this? Hello? Oh, yeah. Go ahead, read it. I love Angie. Other side. Sorry. Dear God, did I hear you right today? Did I hear you say that you love me? Even though you and I both know I've messed up so many times. Did I hear you say you want to use me? And I feel so useless. If you'll take me and use me, then 
God, I give you all that I am. Take me. I love you, God. I love you too. And I love you too much just to leave you where you're at. This salvation that you hold, I don't want it to be some sentimental gush or some head knowledge. I want you to work it out in every detail of your life. And when problems come and chaos happens, don't look at it as a, as a prison, but look at it as a father disciplines his child. A father disciplines the ones he loves. I know, but it's gonna be tough. Yes, but you bought into the lie thinking everything was gonna be easy when you gave everything over to me. There will be trouble in this world, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. I want you to do something. I want you to look out there and I want you to say, Tommy is God's original masterpiece. Tommy is God's... No, not the way you see yourself or you try so desperately for others to see you, but maybe for the first time in your life, the way I see you, the way I created you. Tommy is God's original masterpiece. Yes, you are. And so are you. God doesn't make junk. You are an original masterpiece. As you look at the video, as you look at our reading today, change is all around us. We saw a one-on-one -on -one between God and a man and the change he just went through. Why are we so scared of change? Why are we as a church scared of change? Pastor Mike made a comment last week about how if a um, member comes in the church and somebody's sitting in their chair, they could freak out. Things are changing. When church is meeting together to find a vision, figure out how do we reach out to those out there? Why do people flinch? Why do we like to say this phrase? The old adage, because we always done it this way. What is it about change that makes us want to stop? But it's not just the church. It's ourselves. There's something about us that's going inside of us that does want to be want change to happen. We love to be comfortable. We love it because we believe we are in control. And what we just saw here, what we've seen in our reading is what happens when we realize who truly is in control. Our reading takes place in John chapter 5 in Bethesda, the sheep's gate pool. This is on the north side of the Temple Mount. Jesus goes here to visit hundreds of sick and lame people. And of all these sick and lame people lying by the pool hoping to be healed, he visits just one. One person. And he hears his story, hears what's going on with his life, hears what's been happening, and he has only one question to ask him. Do you want to get well? I don't know about you, that's a kind of strange question. You're talking to a man who's been lame for almost 40 years. Of course he wants to get well. Why would you ask such a thing? Because Jesus knows there's something going on. In fact, this lame man doesn't truly understand the question. He gives a response. How does he answer with excuses? Lord, I try to get in, but somebody else gets in before me. I'm trying to fix this. If you listen how he speaks, he's trying to show that he has control in his own healing. So why does Jesus ask this question? Do you want to get well? Because if this man becomes well, that means he can walk. If he can walk, then he can work. And he can provide for himself. If he can work, that means all these years of lying by the pool, being supported by those around him, are finished. He can't go back to the life he was in. He is forever changed because of this encounter with God. And I read this story of Jesus with this lame man, and I start to think of other people in the Bible, people that Jesus had contact with. I think of the disciples, and even Paul, who we read about tonight. When we talk about the disciples, these individuals, 
They were his learners. They were worried about who Jesus was. But eventually, they become leaders of the church of Jesus. How does something like that happen? How do you go from somebody who's learning to being a leader? Or for the disciples. They saw their teacher die on that cross. But three days later, the risen Lord, He came to them, a one-on-one -on -one with them. He let them know that He was with them, around them, in them. We read last week about how Peter had a vision that he could eat anything. They can go out and eat meals with Gentiles. You know who Gentiles are? Us. God was changing the church right then and there with those leaders. Another person who Jesus has contact with after his resurrection, our risen Lord, is Paul. Who's Paul? Paul was a persecutor of the church of Jesus. That promise of who Jesus is, he was going after those people. But then Jesus visits with him on the road to Damascus, a one-on-one, -on -one, and Paul becomes a proclaimer of the promise of Jesus. Nothing else in the world has that kind of power. Nothing changes a person like the risen Lord. And what do we read tonight? We read that Paul is a missionary, that proclaiming the word that God had a new plan for him. He changed his route to Macedonia. He went up to the, where the Greeks are. He even met with a woman to share the promise of Jesus. God was changing the ancient church. He was changing how this was being spread about because of our risen Lord. Do you know what that tells me? Change is an ancient tradition of the early church. Change has been around since the church has started. Because God is using it to help proclaim the promise of Jesus. That good news of who He is. He's been doing that from the get-go. So why as a church do we sometimes get stunned? Why do we fear change? It's because we want to be in control. But in reality, who's the one who's truly sculpting? Who's the one really in charge? Our Lord. And that, it's about our church. What about us? Change is a scary thing to deal with, isn't it? How do we embrace change? How do we deal with it in our lives? Well, the first important thing is realize we have to give up control. We are not the ones chiseling away ourselves and those around us. We are not the ones in charge. Our Lord is. Our take-homes this week has three devotionals to talk about how do we deal with change. The importance of who truly is in control. Our first devotional is talking about how from Ephesians 2.10. That was a text for the basis of our video. It deals with our identity. Identity. Our culture has changed what that word has me means. Our culture tells you your identity is what you believe, what you think, you think you are. But the Bible has a different answer. Ephesians 2.10 tells us that we are God's handiwork. He continues to sculpt you right now. Throughout the change in your life, what God is doing with you, He is making you into His masterpiece to help share that promise of who Jesus is. Our next reading, our next devotional for this week, comes from Hebrews. Paul is letting us know no matter what change is going on in our life, because it comes from the world, it comes from God, there is one thing we can look to, one thing that we can anchor our hopes into. That's the promise of Jesus. That's the promise that was given to Abraham, that through Abraham, he would redeem his people. It's the promise God gave to Adam and Eve, that through them, he would redeem us all. That's the promise. That no matter what is going on in your life, no matter what changes are happening, you can hold on to. Our last devotional goes back to Ephesians chapter 4. Because of our Lord, our lives are forever changed. This idea of going from old to new, this all happens because we have the Lord inside us. We don't read self-help books or aren't things we do to make us a new person. It's our Lord in us. 
He's the one who helps us put off that old, the, the old and become his new creation. Be what we're supposed to be because he is in us. On the front of your cards, I have a sentence. I am praying for blank this week. Maybe you are somebody who's dealing with a whole bunch of changes right now. I ask you to write your own name down right here. And to pray to your Father in Heaven, your Creator, because He is listening to you. To know that He is with you with your changes. But maybe you know somebody who's having a hard time with the changes in their life. Write their name down. Hand it to them. Let them know that you are praying for them. That they are not alone. That their Father is with them. That no matter what's happening, they have one anchor. That promise of Jesus. As you walk out these doors, we follow the words of what Jesus said to the lame man by the pool. Get up. Pick up your mat and walk. Because change is coming. Please pray with me.